As soon as architecture began to realize its culpability in the global climate crisis, it focused on remediation and fixes to get away from the fact that it was contributing to over half the world's greenhouse gases, to say nothing about the depletion of some rare natural resources. Sustainability began to take up the spaces that had formerly been set aside for theory, and in some cases, architecture theory was obliged to consider the mainly technological issues of how to stop polluting the world. There is no question about whether architecture should or should not do everything possible to achieve sustainability, whatever that might mean. But there is a question about whether this should be a theory issue, which would make this mandate seem to be debatable, in the same way that theory implies debate. I wanted to go around this confusion of theory and sustainability by pointing to the historical fact that sustainability has been at the center of theory since at least 520 BC, but that it was introduced as the universal need for symmetry and balance in both the microcosm and microcosm, that is, in both the cosmos, taken in the most universal sense, and the human subject, even down to the microbiological level. The metaphor of wheels within wheels has dominated all versions of this discussion, the most conclusive example of which might be the Mayan calendar, which is the only humanly conceived model of time that has achieved such an extraordinary degree of accuracy and at the same time given humans, as temporal subjects, instructions on how to live. In comparison to the Mayans, the Greeks started out simple, with a schema based on two distinctions, the temperature or energy contrast of hot and cold, and the fluid difference of wet and dry. Combining these, Alcmaeon of Croton, who lived from 540 to 500 BC, a physician, put forward a theory that these two distinctions would produce four material substances that were key to the creation of personality differences and disorders in all human beings. But that was just the beginning of the quadration of human subjectivity. The four humors, blood, collar, phlegm, and black bile, became things that would later be handled not just by your physician or psychotherapist, but by your own environmental scientist. If you consulted an astrologer, they would also use the system. Each level and type of concern addressed the issue of balance. You could have too much or too little of these substances. Too little color or aggressiveness would leave you passive and defenseless. Too much and you would be the class bully and later on the hated despot. Too much phlegm and you wouldn't have the energy to get out of bed in the morning. Too little and you would lack all caution and get into trouble because of rash behavior. There was an exception, however. While collar, blood, and phlegm were good as long as they weren't in excess, melancholy was judged to be harmful in any amount. This made the circle model too simple. There was a twist at the humor of melancholy, not just because it was a poison at any level, but because the poison was also in some circumstances a cure. This is reflected in the Greek word pharmakon, which means both a poison and an elixir deadly and life-giving. You could say that, looking at the circle, melancholy involved a twist that corresponded to the ways that the planets would sometimes appear to go backwards. For centuries, the logical order of the humors was used to model the seasons, because at least in the Mediterranean climate of Greece, where winters were cold and wet and the falls were cold and dry, it worked. However, there was a problem. The logical order generated by the two contrasts between temperature and fluid did not explain the sequence of human behavior and cultural life, where after a period of success, things declined and died, and before they could be reborn, there had to be a period of isolation, where time and space were radically different. This interval had to be melancholy. It couldn't be anything where a balance was involved. It had to be a place of logical reversal 
where poisons became cures, and cures were to be found in poisons. Switching phlegm and melancholy was also the way stories were told, where the hero had to disappear for a period in order to appear miraculously at the point where a sanguine order, a relationship based on blood, could be restored. In all cultures, the initiation of the youth into adult life was based on this logic, and rituals of transformation, called rites of passage, were based on the idea that, after death, there was an interval of trial, judgment, humiliation, and moral testing. While the upper part of the revised edition of the humoristic cycle was like life from birth to death, the lower part was not just outside. It required reverse order thinking, from death back to birth, which became by definition rebirth. The upper level was heroic, since it seemed to follow the order of the birth, life, adventures, and final death of the hero. The lower level was actually anti-heroic. Any attempt to do good ended in creating a mess. There was no logic of effective planning. In other words, the lower half, beneath the wet line connecting the warm wet of blood to the cold wet of phlegm, was the cold, dry space of vaudeville. This is where satire, farce, mockery, and slapstick humor could reduce everything and everyone to irony, that, at least, we might find something to laugh about, because that would be all that would be left. This made sense not just for storytelling, but early psychology of the subject, who was dealing with anxiety in a world regarded as realistic and responsive, where it made sense to try to do the right thing. Melancholy's place of dry cold was the place of immortality, but only in the sense of having to wait forever for something to happen. It seemed that psychotics, that is, crazy people, lived in this melancholic world instead of being fully alive but it was also the space designated for artists, whose genius was the other side of the madness they seemed to endure. The same is true today, of course, where we tend to regard artists on the same level as lovers and madmen, just as Shakespeare did in the 16th century. Technically speaking, psychoanalysis would say that all three have problems with the paternal signifier, which is a fancy way of saying that they don't know what it means to join a club, where you have to give up something to be considered one of the gang. In culture, it's the same deal. You put up with being misrecognized in order to be accepted as a part of the cultural whole. The paternal signifier is key to this sacrifice of mistaken identity. And if you don't accept it, you don't gain a real identity. You lose the fake one that allowed you to at least feel like you belonged. The universality of the paternal signifier idea, as both something that could be present or absent, was made evident by anthropologists, philologists, that is, students of different languages and customs, archaeologists, and even returning missionaries who had studied customs in foreign lands. Every culture, it seemed, used the same circular pattern with the one twisty part. Every culture had stories about heroes who lived, died, were absent, and returned. The massive amount of new data encouraged studies about the structure of these stories and the beliefs they supported. To compress a very large amount of history into a single idea, we might say that, with the paternal signifier in place, there is history and storytelling. Without it, there is melancholy, but also the possibility of science, which Giambattista Vico calls a new science. Spengler calls decline, and Northrop Fry calls criticism as anatomy. This seems like a kind of meta-theory that Lacan said we should not do, but in fact psychoanalysis serves as a meta-critique of subjectivity and as a model for all of the other versions of meta-theories, including the theory of humors and adaptations such as Hayden White's Four Kinds of Historical Insight. Ernst Cassirer's symbolic forms, 
also use metaphor and metonymy to narrate a sequence of human awareness from myth to concept. So we could say that the question of structure relies both on the circle and the non-circle. The upper seasonal cycle of three humors, coupled with a lower stasis or anti-seasonal, anti-temporal position of melancholy. Even the fake versions seem to get it more or less right, such as Joseph Campbell's reverse order version of Vladimir Prope and Lord Raglan's sequence, showing how the palindrome is built into the system, making going backwards and going forwards equivalent to each other. This is also what makes the hero leaving home for a series of adventures the same as the hero dying, and the hero's descent into the underworld equal to the hero's birth as a hero. Lord Raglan demonstrated the downside of seeing the circle as a fixed series of themes, because each theme can be expanded indefinitely to the point where it converts into its opposite. We have a circle that doesn't contain, but is more like a point that is contained, a kind of hypersphere. Think of the circle, then, as a verb, a circling, but a circle that fails to close on itself. The same failed circle logic applies when the humoristic categories are carried into critical methods. Almost any arrangement works out, because each category is a model of the whole. The only thing that changes is the point of view, the place where the circle begins and tries to end. Does the organic worldview begin with death or life? It's hard to say. The two are not exactly equal, but either makes a good starting point, but just as good an ending point. Is mechanism really mechanical? As with the metaphor of the ghost and the machine, it often seems that machines, like puppets, are capable of having a mind of their own precisely because they have given up on free will entirely. So we could quibble about the precise location of any of the critical categories in relation to the humors, because the system itself is a design of exchange, not fixed positions. This is where the humoristic system becomes the obvious historical model for Freud and Lacan's ideas of the human subject. If the whole system is about exchange, we are talking about energy, not static elements. Energy is nothing if it is not being moved around, creating and being created by differences. We are able to expand the clunky box model of humors for a more pyramidal model, where there is a point at the top in a disk or 3D sphere at the bottom. But the reverse also makes sense. I'm showing it here so that we won't get dizzy talking about how the performative involves a sequence connecting opposite ends of the life spectrum with a wet line, but also how the wet line is a circle compared to the world river the Greeks called Okeanos that is both enclosed and enclosing. The narrative points on the humoristic circle use pronouns that make it ambiguous whether the person who is banished in the spring may not actually be the person who must die in the fall. And while the hero of summer is just a balance point between success and failure, the genius at the bottom of the pyramid is perpetually both a failure and a success, just as all artists, if they are artists, embrace failure and success equally. As we begin to identify positions on this drawing with Lacanian commodities, such as the signifier with the big S and the signified with the little s, the big A other or ultra at the top and the little a ultra on the bottom, we realize that psychoanalysis too is an energy exchange system, not static commodities. What is performative is the signifier, as it relates to other signifiers in chains that present the subject to other signifiers in a process that also involves sexual difference and the shortfalls and overshots that characterize human communication. As Baudelaire said, if we actually did understand each other, we would never be able to agree on anything. The performative means that we must pretend to understand each other 
while at the same time we are misrepresenting and being misrepresented. Everything above the wet line is about failing to communicate, but at the same time saying more than we meant to say. Beneath the wet line is the dry lockbox of potential meanings, signifieds rather than signifiers, because they are bodiless spirits waiting to be reborn. All we really know about this lower space is that it lacks the temporality of the performative upper realm. That as soon as something is thought, it becomes a reality. As soon as there is an effect, the causes seem to spring into place as if they had been there all the time. Lacan uses this as soon as model to explain how, in metaphor, what we see is created simultaneously by something that is made to disappear. A metaphor on the left of the dot is the replacement of the one signifier by another which masks it or suppresses it. To the right of the dot is what appears as the result of this, creating immediately an X that is the sense of meaning, but a mysterious meaning. The top S prime can extend forever, almost. It is the performative component. But because it was created by a suppression, it can be canceled out by its mirror twin. And to the right of the arrow, we can restate metaphor as that which terminates its mystery in a signified that is the meaning of the one, that is both a number and a pure distinction, the mirroring that separated the metaphor from its metonymic extension. This is a lot to take in, but it does show how the suppression of metaphor, which is in the position of the humor of phlegm on the right, crisscrosses with the emergence associated with spring on the left. The left to right reading of performance from spring to fall requires a crisscross that we can see only when we cut a section line through the dome and see the arc as a crisscross of energies left to right and right to left. In other words, the energetics of the psyche, like the energetics of the humoristic system, is a palindrome. Lacan gives us several versions of the palindrome. The most famous is the Borromeonaut, or rather self-intersecting pile of rings, known as the RSI, or Real Symbolic Imaginary Domains. Each ring sits on top of the ring before it, and beneath the one after it. But if you look at it closely, the whole stack folds into itself so that any one ring is simultaneously a top, a bottom, and a middle. This is an energy exchange system. The Cayley-Klein matrix formalizes what is happening in the Borromeo knot by separating out an E principle, which could be stated as any two things are held together by the one thing that is not included. When A is paired with B, C is the result. But its relation to itself is not itself. It's an E. Even the relation of E with itself is an E. So it's just the energy that's happening. The directions and endpoints are entirely flexible. The key point here is that the as soon as principle is the simultaneous melancholy element, where as soon as something is suppressed on the right, it reappears on the left or vice versa. The cut that divides things is also the cut that connects them by this instant appearance and disappearance. With the cut as not just timeless, but timelessness itself, the E principle sounds pretty abstract. But we have the traditions of melancholy that are nearly constant from ancient times to present. When we talk about melancholy people, such as artists, fools, and lovers, we talk about the illogical operation of what Freud called the death drive. This is the way that melancholy seems to paralyze its victims, trap them in a self-constructed paradox, an if that immediately imposes a then consequence that is self-defeating. However, the melancholic gets pleasure from repeating this timeless connection, this automatic if-then logic. It seems to be meaningful in itself, although it deconstructs the meaning of everything else. If you think of artists, however, you see how deconstruction can be used to advantage. Artists see what non-artists can't see because they take things apart. 
think of cubism here in order to put them together again in a way that reveals a hidden truth. Freud discovered this creativity of deconstruction when he personally experienced the logic of metaphor while traveling through Italy. He visited the cathedral in Orvieto and was impressed by the mural painted by the artist Signorelli, shown here standing in front of the artist Fra Angelico, who had been assigned the same wall space but wasn't able to finish. Although the painting per se is not a part of the story, just Signorelli's name, which Freud forgot, we should note that it depicts the preaching of the Antichrist. Two artists contending from the same space in the cathedral echo the Christ and Antichrist theme. When Freud tried to remember the name of the painter of the mural that had so impressed him in Orvieto, he couldn't recall it. Instead, he stumbled over various wrong guesses. Later, he reflected that these guesses had a spooky connection with the German word for sir, hair. Seeing Signor in Signorelli was something only a foreigner would do. An Italian wouldn't notice it, but Freud would translate Signor to Herr and link it to Herzegovina, then Bosnia from Bosnia and Herzegovina, connected to a series of B-named painters, Botticelli and Boltrafio. The Trafio component of Boltrafio separated off and became the small town Trafio, where Freud's former patient, troubled by sexual dysfunction, had committed suicide. News of the sad event connected to Freud's conversations with fellow physician travelers about their Turkish patients, who always called their doctors Sir or Herr, and how the Turks would give up life before giving up sex. These chained connections depended on one thing, however, the ability to split signifiers into two parts and create steps out of the halves. This kind of signifier has a special name, metonymy, where the semantic divide between part and whole can be converted to a generic divide devoted to other connections. Freud indicated the breaks with circles and brackets, but we can think of them as the third ring function of the Borromeo knot. Metonymy helps us see how the performative arc is created and how there are two motions, one forward and one backward. Although Freud is moving across the Adriatic landscape, a stranger in a strange land, he marks his travel with stories sharing the common feature of his forgetting the name Signorelli. Each wrong guess is a case of an error, but each error marks a pathway like a trail of breadcrumbs, allowing this first act of forgetting to reach back in time to the reason for the substitutions, the fact that Freud, as a foreigner, noticed what natives would not see. He saw Signor in Signorelli, and this special vision led to the supercharged signifiers that, by being not Signorelli, were other things connected in Freud's mind. This formed the metonymic arch of the hero, the someone who must leave home, that is retroactively discovered at point one, the point of forgetting, but secondarily realized as being the original point one, where something must be banished. That would be Freud, a stranger in a strange land, in possession of a secret that he didn't know because he couldn't remember. Freud was a case of the Alfred Hitchcock movie, The Man Who Knew Too Much, pursued by others who refuse to tell him what it is they are after. This is how metonymy is able to divide consciousness from the unconscious, and how that divide is the thing we're after, the bar between the signifier and the signified. The humoristic model suggests that this divide is the wet line connecting blood relations on the left with death relations on the right. That would also be Freud's case of identifying the title of the sir, the hair or seigneur, the traditional master of the family, with a shadow twin on the right, the mysterious ex-patients, suicidal and sex-obsessed, who would rather die than do without sex. These ghosts haunt Freud at every point of his travel. If you see the performative arc as an architectural arch, you could say that this force is what supports it from below. 
and you could even say that the vector of this force is the dry line connecting melancholy with color, the poet of the unconscious with the realistic scientist of consciousness. The timelessness of the treasury means that each part of the arch is supported from below in the same way that all of the stories and wrong guesses had an element of the original signor that Freud had forgotten. What is the meaning of this dry line of vertical support of the performative arch? If each and every point of the travel across from blood to phlegm, marriage to funerals, so to speak, is supported to create an arch of the hero's ascent and descent, the wet line of travel must be kept afloat by a dry line that is like the E principle of the Cayley Klein matrix, the absent element role. The absent element in this arch is melancholy. So now we know that the E principle is what makes melancholy different from the other humors. It's its timelessness, its assimilation of and identification with opposition. This gives it a power of the one-to-one -one relationship that embraces difference in the form of oppositions, conflicts, and contradictions so that errors become the masks of truth. Suppression is balanced off by emergence. Metaphor is balanced off by metonymy. This is the whole secret of performance, the upper cyclical part of the humoristic system. It is continually creating points of intersection. Each time it reaches a point that seems to be the product of nothing but chance and accident, it turns out to be a point that is determined from below by dark forces of fate. We can take this back to the E principle of the Cayley Klein matrix, the Borromeo knot principle, that any two things, in this case the before and after, or if and then, or cause and effect, are held together precisely by what is missing. The if and then of the performative is always a debatable connection. You can see things from different angles. You can miss the point. But the E connection is absolute. Its timelessness is also its one-to-one -one correspondence. The fact that what we construct in the arched space connecting birth and death has a truth written with a capital T, a necessity that is unshakable and eternal, what Vico called the ideal eternal history. This was an imaginary that was the cut, the one that was a one-to-one, -one, a sheer relational principle, a pure flow of energy. As soon as we make something, there is a truth involved that is not just a causal relation, but a flow of energy from a source below, a truth of truth. At each point of what we make in our temporal human experience, there is an E principle. The possibility of substitution we have in metaphor is simultaneously the metonymic chain of signifiers that constructs an arch linking birth with death, in a way that one becomes indistinguishable from the other. In religious terms, this is the belief in reincarnation. But as this idea is secularized in critical thinking, we are able to realize the relation between suppression that the psyche does in order to have a world of appearances and relationships, and emergence, which links signifiers to each other in chains that we call communications. The one thing we know about communication is that it fails, but it fails symmetrically. We both fail to say what we mean, and at the same time, other people can read into what we say to understand more than what we meant. This conjunction of the plus and minus means that communications is always a ratio, never an equal sign. Lacan's image for this situation was the torus, which combines the idea that something can be contained, such as the air inside a bicycle tire, but also that non-containment is required, that is, the hole in the donut. Lacan was a very good geometry student. He got A's on every exam because he did his homework. Just as the system of humorous turns out to be a torus connecting the temporality of performance with the compulsive repetition of the lower domain, 
connecting melancholy with all of the other three humors, just as the E principle connected to the temporal arch of birth to death we call experience, the proper geometric way of graphing projective surfaces is called the reference polygon. This shows us that the cross cap is what the torus wants to be when it grows up. This is because the cross cap, basically a sphere that can hold water on the bottom thanks to the fact that the top is pinched into a figure eight where the inside becomes the outside and vice versa, is the inverse of our humoristic model. This is the principle of non-orientation that we encounter when we mark the two sides of the Mobius strip with arrows that contradict each other, thanks to the twist that makes the two surfaces into one. A cross cap is a form that is a hollow container on the bottom, but a non-orientable exchange of inside and outside on the top. It's an upside down model of consciousness as a machine that attempts to contain things with definitions and boundaries, the performative part of the human subject, and the exchange circuit that achieves timelessness by twisting the wires. You can't connect plus and minus directly, as in the case of a sphere. That would cancel out to zero. But you can twist the circuit so that plus and minus circulate simultaneously. Non-orientation is what makes projective figures such as the torus, Klein bottle, cross cap, and other cases of the real projective plane able to combine continents and incontinents. In other words, they are traps without gates or walls. Just as the humoristic system is a circuit that combines continents and incontinence, or performance with melancholy, topological figures in non-Euclidean two-space combine continents and incontinence by being circuits rather than the forms we think we see when we look at the torus and say, bicycle tire, or donut. These are what happens when the topological form is immersed into three space. It takes on properties it doesn't really have in order for us to be able to see them as objects in Euclidean space. But the visual dimension doesn't exist for 2D topology. To get back to the original truth of topology, we have to subtract our visual privilege, just as the knife cuts into the bagel in this example. We see that the torus is the result of two faces of the same cut, both of which are Mobius bands. The cut is the reality, but we can see the cut only as two faces, one left-hand version, the other a right-hand version. Left and right become clockwise and counterclockwise in the story of the foundation of Rome. You may know the basics. Romulus establishes the site of the city by plowing a furrow where the walls will be built. But his brother Remus mocks the sacred ritual by jumping over the sacred line and has to be killed. It's Remus's blood that fills the furrow, the requirement that any boundary be authenticated by live sacrifice. Right away you can spot the melancholic twin, the one who must die so that the other brother might enjoy family relations, the blood of all happy marriages. Together, the twins will rule upper and lower universes, the realms of the dead and the living. They are the double circuit that will protect Rome from invasions by real warriors or evil spirits. The one line that does this is called the pomerium, the space above the plowed circle that is kept clear so that priests of the city can renew its powers on a regular schedule. The historical fact of the pomerium shows how the system of humors and its variants are not fictions or characterizations, but protocols that must be followed to ensure the continents of protected space. The real space of Rome is even identified as such in the law books of the city. The only Rome was this toroidal boundary. The spaces inside and outside the walls were just territories. When history confirms the logic of the humors, which is also the logic of parapraxis, we know that the distinctions between signifiers and signifieds, metaphor and metonymy, and the topologies that construct these distinctions are not just abstract theories. They are the real stuff the human world is made of. 
Finally, we come to the central thesis of this lecture on the four humors and their relation to psychoanalysis. Freud stated late in life that psyche was extended and, or but, knew nothing about it, meaning possibly that the unconscious of our minds was constituted by the way mind extended into the material world. But I think it's possible to go further here. We can connect the way that Romulus founded Rome as a kind of drawing made on the ground that Vitruvius called iconography, a pacing out of a boundary line. This was not just an extension of psyche, but psyche itself doing the walking. That is, the act wasn't a representation, it was the real thing. Psyche becomes psyche by performing itself and providing itself the vertical support of melancholy, the E principle. This extension performance is a self-construction based on a division, and it's time to name the division with a special term, the catagraphic mark. The catagraph is a cut that defines what it cuts into at the moment it makes the cut. Its effectiveness is that as soon as the cut is made, the two parts of space that are separated come into being. You don't have one without the other. This is not just a theoretical abstraction. You have two important examples in history. The Greek word katagraphene is not a common term, but it relates to a story told by Pliny called the Injunction of Pophelius, which Lacan mentions in Seminar 9, Identification, and to the biblical story of Jesus in the case of the woman convicted of adultery. The catagraphic mark makes the surface of its medium into a 2D manifold, so that encirclement has the magic effect of being an apotrope, paralyzing or halting those who would do you evil. The deeper sense of catography goes back, however, to the story of Romulus and Remus, and how it takes two kings to rule a kingdom, one living and one dead. This is the theme of the uncanny, the living person with an element of death and a dead person who does not take death all that seriously, as in the story of Castor and Pollux. The Pomerium example has a lot of frills to it because stories have to be written in the style of any event involving an unknown future that, once resolved, becomes a past with multiple meanings. To take a story back to its logical basis, we have to construct a minimalistic model that shows what is necessary to make the parts hold together and move. We can define the torus as the movement of a clock, just as the minute hand, but this doesn't explain how the movement is stabilized. A one arm pivoting from a non-existent central point is impossible. We have to imagine, just to make this example work, two clocks connected by a single rod or beam. Metaphorically, the clocks would be running in the same direction with respect to the torus tube, but opposite directions with respect to each other. Strange to say, this comes very close to the relation of Castor and Pollux, who are dead to each other, but alive in the space they occupy. This kind of separation allows the twins to be equal agents as long as they are held apart by this rigid rod, keeping the torus in balance. The torus needs these twins, and the twinship idea is inherently toroidal, meaning that the ritual required to be found in a city is necessarily a torus. Well, we already knew that, because the pomerium is basically a torus, and its usefulness lies in its temporal alternation between opposed forces. It is like the plus and minus charge of an electrical circuit. Without the polarity, there is no flow. Without the flow, there is no circuit. Without the circuit, there is no protection from attacks, physical or spiritual. Topology, I would suggest, is the only way to understand Freud's enigmatic claim that psyche is extended. The implication of that claim is that the psyche is extension itself, and we avoid the mind-body problem by seeing how melancholy is a structural principle of the performative arch made by the narrative traditions since ancient times. 
thanks to the ageless dramatic questions of who must be excluded, who must leave home, and who must die. Melancholy supports this arc of birth, life, and death, with a logic where suppression and expression create metonymic signifying chains. This is Lacan's theory of metaphor, and it is the centerpiece of his theory of topology, which shows how continence and incontinence are two sides of the same coin. The emergence of metonymic signifying chains create a sense of meaning that is parapractic and a melancholy, because it has to do with a traumatic loss that has been suppressed. The signifiers do not have the answer. They simply close the circle with a twist that makes the number one the logic of the signified and also a mirroring function. We're reminded that the mirror is not a reflection, but a cut in space. The one, the unary trait, cuts into itself, and the depths of the mirror appear inside the space. This brings the power of the one to support the arch of performance as it connects what is historically second to what is logically first, but only noticed afterwards. Since the proofs of this theory should be drawn from ethnography, the point is that cultural practices do not abide by the rules and restrictions of logic, but, as inactive, use effectiveness as their only guide. 